And Liz, I'm delighted to uh, help those neurons glow. Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome everyone to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, creator, chief cat herder, and your guide to the next hour of conversation. We have two terrific guests and on a very, very important topic. We've been exploring what Web3 means and what it means in particular for higher education for several sessions so far. We've had a couple of sessions that look at the side of Web3 dedicated to the blockchain, to decentralized ownership of data. And now what we'd like to do is turn to the other side of Web3, which is the virtual world side or the XR side. And we're gonna do that when the company of two forum favorites long-running friends and leading experts in the world on the subject. Maya Gorgieva is at the New School, where she runs a wonderful and early XR center there, where they do cutting-edge research into emerging technologies for teaching and learning. And Emery Craig is the current CEO of the Digital Bodies website and consultancy, where he consults around the world and researches where XR is headed. Uh, they're great people. I can't praise them enough. I strongly recommend Digital Bodies so strongly that you can see a little button on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Now what I'd like to do uh, is bring them up on stage. So first of all, if I could bring Maya up on stage, and let me just make some room here. Hello, Maya. Hello, Brian. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, how is everything in New York? Uh, it's actually been quite cold in the last couple of days, and today we are going to experience uh, actually warming up and um, hoping we get some spring because we got some spring flowers and then it got really cold. And wow. I was, yeah, I'm hoping that you know we you know these flowers are coming back and staying, and more are coming back. I can't wait for you know truly like the warmer weather in New York City. Really? Spring in New York City is intoxicating. Um, Maya, uh, looking ahead past spring, looking ahead to the next 12 months, what are you going to be working on? What are the big projects and the big topics that you're going to be thinking about and uh, addressing? Oh my gosh, this is a loaded question, especially in the times of what I see we are in transition, right? And uh, for me, in particular, is in transition. I started the X Reality Center um, about five years ago at the New School. I was invited to launch the center, and we've we've, we've just been working and focusing on immersive storytelling, design, um, you know, creative <clears throat> research, but also research in ethics um, and um, social research and its impact on society. Expanding all of extended reality, virtual augmented reality. I teach a course, immersive storytelling, uh, and uh, try to empower a number of faculty from all corners of the university to actually see the potential and what that brings to their field. Um, and at the moment, we are actually relaunching something even bigger called the Innovation Center at the new school, which is actually going to house the all the work we do with extended reality. But in addition to that, we're bringing um, um, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Um, and it's just our way to kind of have this umbrella space, um, this innovation lab that will be working with frontier technology, XR, uh, AI, and quantum. And so quite exciting, working on actually setting up our physical space um, to open up uh, in the fall. So lots of work needs to happen between now and fall. Um, in, but we continue with you know, some of our projects and, and also dreaming big uh, about our future. Oh, I bet you are. How many how many people work in your center right now? So we we actually a very small team. Um, it, my position is one of an interesting position, which is actually was from the very beginning. It's it's a linchpin position. I actually um, am am you know kind of. Um, working um in with the cio office and emerging technologies and at the same time i'm um, actually have a dotted line to the provost office i'm very engaged in curriculum development and some of other activities um you know that usually you not know, take shape uh in the provost office and i'm a, a bit of like you know a translator like i'm a little bit of a negotiator uh ambassador you know kind of actually working through um, um across these two groups um in our center we're very lucky we have uh, an amazing opportunities with uh, particularly uh with our both undergraduate and graduate uh, students coming uh, from the person school of design and our phd students coming from social research and so we are uh, truthfully they they part they are 
part, part, big part of our team. But being in IT, I also have the potential of, you know, bringing, you know, development support when needed um, and uh, driving these initiatives. And we are a team otherwise, you know, basically usually of two to three people uh, with a core team with uh, this satellite team that joins us for oftentimes they stay with us to two, two years that that makes it all happen, you know, when we, we get together. Well, it sounds like a great group and definitely to me, it also sounds like a kind of uh, time travelers from the future, uh, bringing what's next to, to the present. Um, well, we have Maya on stage. Now let me add uh, her partner and her partner in crime, uh, Emery Craig, also coming to us from New York, I think. And uh, Emery, let's see, there we are. And here, let me adjust the screen so everyone looks and can see each other. How are you doing, Emery? Okay, well, I'm doing all right. I, as I think you know, I seem to have caught the flu or something. I don't, I don't have COVID, but I've been under the weather for the past week. So apologies in advance if you hear me coughing away and I'm drinking orange juice and you know Good. trying to take medication that doesn't somehow make me woozy headed. So I'm some coherent at least till the evening. But yeah, so yeah, doing all right. Huh? I think you under the weather is like the combination of four brilliant people on an ordinary day. <laughs> Um, I please feel better. Please thank, feel better. thank you, thank you so much. And you know, this I get sick of like only once a decade, it seems like, and it's always in the spring around this time. And yeah, I, I got it again this week, really bad. So April um, is the cruelest month. A, um, April's always the month, but it is spring in New York City, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting out and about, and you know. Well, well speaking yeah. about um, before ten years go by, what does the next year look like for you? What are you going to be working on, and where are you going to be going, and what are you going to be doing? I suspect I'll be all over the world again, which is where I was in 2019. I mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. my full-time position gratefully about six five months before COVID hit. So I, I got out the door just in time, I like to say. And as it was, I was even back then already traveling a lot. But that fall, right before COVID, I was, you know, everywhere from Asia to the Middle East to Europe to all over the United States. Um, things have started to pick up again. So I, I suspect that I will be on the road um, starting late summer, early fall and on through and working with um, higher education institutions, working with K-12, which I find fascinating. I, I, I love doing that also. And of course, mm -hmm. higher ed just sort of kind of brackets aside K-12, like that's something else. That's the, mm -hmm. you know, that that's the, the, the amateur leagues before they get to us kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the stuff going on there is really important. But I also love working with nonprofits, museums, NGOs, and mm -hmm. other organizations. And that, that actually has been some of the most interesting work that I've been doing. And I suspect I'll be continuing that work this year. So, because um, it's, it's great, you know, when you're working in an area and you're doing something that has a real impact, as Maya knows so well from her background, on human rights or on, you know, cross-cultural understanding. And, um, you know, when, you, when you're doing that, you really feel like you're making a difference in the world, not just to students' lives, but to everybody on the ground in, you know, parts of the world that can be incredibly challenging sometimes. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, everybody, you may see Emery in a neighborhood near you, uh, looks like, in the next year. Uh, good luck um, and, and safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, this is not the traditional interview program. Uh, I'm just the moderator here. I have a bunch of questions, but what's more important are your questions. So what questions do you have? What concerns? What ideas? What hopes? What aspirations? What basic questions? What advanced questions do you have for our two experts on extended reality and higher education? Are you thinking in terms of pedagogy? Are you thinking in terms of support? research, preservation, how institutions respond, the role of students. The floor is yours to ask questions. And I'll, I'll kick things off to get people going. But again, this is this is the venue for you to pose your thoughts and questions. Um, one quick one to, uh, to ask the two of you. Um, a couple of years ago when, uh, when Facebook, excuse me, Meta um, was, was advancing with uh, Oculus, um, People talked a lot about the kind of competition between VR and video conferencing. Um, you know, two very, very different ways to get people together in a synchronous way, mm -hmm. spatially distanced. 
Um, yet it seems like after two plus years, the pandemic, that we're pretty thoroughly immersed in tools like this one uh, in video conferencing. I haven't seen a lot of people using XR. Is X, are we still just in that early a time for XR or is the is XR's great wave still coming up? I think, in, in, you know, sometimes the question is really, you know, the, these um, these different different platforms actually address um, different needs. And the, the other part about that is access, right? Um, and ubiquity. Now, laptops, mobile phones are ubiquitous devices, uh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, at least in, yeah. in the yeah. spaces, you know, where most of our students right now um, North America, Europe, um, you know, where there is uh, access to these resources, access to uh, sufficient bandwidth in other parts of the world. That works. Now, that creates an efficiency. Uh, efficiency are sometimes good. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's great to be able to, um, you know, basically able to connect and have this five minute, 10 minute, or even like an event like this one, a good conversation um, on, that, that doesn't present barriers to entry. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. Like people now, um, you know, before we were kind of, oh, like, uh, you know, the phys you know, meeting in physical spaces is the best we can do. Now we all have kind of figured out that we can make these spaces work uh, with the appropriate affordances, tools, appropriate moderation <coughs> facilitations. You do, Brian, so well here at the forum. Um, and so I think this is why uh, we, you know, we crave that social connection, in particularly in, in this pandemic, and we found our spaces and we can access them easily. The headset is simply not a household item. Um, the laptops that are uh, required sometimes to run smoothly immersive experiences. Now we don't want to be buffering on this and buffering in VR is no fun, no no, no good experience. And I, you know, if I, I would, um, you know, basically suggest this over a buffering experience in virtual reality. Oh, so would I. Yes. And so this is, I think, part of uh, where we are, uh, you know, that, you know, and, and we should kind of think about this as different. Again, I, I often, um, you know, times the question is why virtual reality? Um, and that's a good way to think about why should we go to these spaces and not solve this via chat or via video conferencing or something else? Um, and I think that's that's a sort of some ways to frame this question. And the, the second part is that um, the VR headset is not a household item. Um, you know, spaces, comfort level uh, is is still, you know, something that we're developing and building and, and people are just kind of warming up to it. Young and, and you know, I think age is not a factor. Like I, I teach an immersive storytelling class with 70 students in, in our fall. Um, and uh, it, it is just really people coming from different backgrounds and different personalities and personal experiences um, enter these spaces and have different feelings about them. And so, um, you know, whether they're 25 or 45 um, or, you know, anywhere. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a... I think there are all of these things that matter uh, when uh, you know we're choosing where to meet. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, and I know some things um, that um, Amory can speak to, there has been developments. These headsets have improved. Um, the spaces we can meet in virtual uh, world are, you know, uh, have you know have been created or exist now. Uh, we have lots to desire in them, uh, but uh, we are, you know, we're building them. We're building these stages. Yeah, and I would say there's been some good good learning experiences in virtual worlds. I've seen some institutions use them. I know my even you yourself have used some at the new school. But you know we're still limited, and in, in part, as just my said, by the headsets, but we're also very limited by bandwidth. Um, you know, and what it what what it means is we end up dumbing down our virtual worlds. So they don't look that much better than what we had in the Second Life on a flat screen you know, a couple of decades ago. And that's just because full body avatars, and we're, we will have that someday, five to 10 years down the road. Um, but, you know, 
we don't have it right now for not something that can be widely used. And that just really creates challenges. So, you know, the virtual worlds we have, whether it be Verbella or, you know, other ones, um, they just, they're useful in some circumstances, but we still fall back on more traditional video conferencing or something like Shindig. Well, it's, uh, we get that live face-to-face uh, appearance of you all. Uh, you know, I get to see uh, what your faces, hear your voices, but also get to look you know, past you and see a little of the light coming in from the window or look at the art on your walls. Um, and that's rich. <laughs> that, gives, that gives us a, a sense of, of, of who you are. We need to go for it. Thank you. That's, those are great answers to my, uh, to my really um, uh, grim question. But we have a whole ton of questions that have just piled in that are really good. And I want to make sure that, um, that they get to go instead of me, because that's much better. Uh, Rick Bartlett from Tabor College asks a great practical question. What would you recommend as a starting space for a small college that wants to enter the AR VR space, particularly in the realm of teaching? You get this question about 20 times a day, right? Uh, we do. But we're in this space where I hope that we, we get and continue to see people entering the space. So yeah. I usually say, um, I'm glad you're at this point thinking about it. That is great. Um, my question to you would be, you know, ha- has there been every, anything, and you can like answer to the chat, but has there anything else going on on campus? Is this kind of your first entry point? Because I oftentimes suggest that your first entry point to the community, the students, the faculty, should be actually a social event. Uh, we we kind of tend to like to talk about that, but this is this is a you know technology or a medium that should be experienced. Uh, and so oftentimes people come up with a misconception what VR is, what AR is, what you know, what it is to put on a headset, how does it work. And so having this opportunity to engage the community in, in a more social place, in a playground, it usually helps a lot in then driving a conversation um, that is around curriculum. Um, which you know usually it requires that you you know the team the faculty you know have developed a, a partnership a connection a collaboration that they can really engage in thinking about what is um, what is going to work in the context of this, this discipline in the context of this course in the, in the context of this experience um, both in terms of you know engagement um, in, with the content with the teams of the top of the, the course as well as in terms of the student experience experience. Um, and so I would say that um, is something that is, is you know, calls for, um, you know, investment on both whether it's the faculty or the team that is about to support the faculty because we oftentimes when we open these spaces on campus for faculty, this is new to them. Well, they, you know, um, we didn't go to, to school in our learning in virtual reality, but now there are new opportunities. So uh, it's important to have that um, partnership model in uh, engaging uh, and thinking and seeing seeing examples of what others are doing or seeing thinking through the context of the topics of the course and where where does uh, it lend itself to be. So um, and I, when I start with that, I often say your course doesn't have to be taught in virtual reality. There's um, there's opportunities in your curriculum probably that fits really well, uh, whether it's to engage students to drive a, a further deeper engagement in terms of the conversations that take place, in terms of the investigation, the hypothesis that students are able uh, to do. In a more STEM field, we already have, we're seeing some interesting simulations on the market. So in the STEM fields, um, you might be able to bring some experiences where faculty can see sort of the opportunity of, you know, learning um, these concepts, phenomena, with, you know, in the 3D space. And the benefits to them, but um, you know, and from kind of like starting in in that collaboration and thinking through the curriculum to, uh, you know, basically going and saying I'm going to teach the entire class in virtual reality. There's quite a journey, and it's very different. And you, you know, somebody that goes there should be very comfortable in going there. Yeah, and and I would just add to this that I think it's really important that you bring everybody to the table at the beginning, that, you know, if you have an interested faculty member, you get interested students, you get IT on board, you get instructional designers involved, everyone, and it's, uh, you know, 
it always struck me that back when the New York Times was doing their amazing VR project, they said one of the most transformative aspects of it was that, of course, the news media industry is as stratified and as siloed as higher education is. Reporters don't talk to editors, don't talk to photographers, so on and so forth. And they said with VR, it was the first time we actually got everybody sitting around the same table because everybody had to be there in order to work out a successful project. And I think in order to do that in, at a higher education institution, you need to have everyone there and you know Maya having her connection to the provost office I know helps a great deal because you're all and it, it, you know can be frustrating but it's it's that it's that benefit of those links between multiple areas in an institution that actually bring this to fruition and make it successful and I know somebody mentioned in the chat student clubs student clubs are a great way to help get started here and there you may find that students are already doing this on their own in which case that's so I've seen VR labs actually grow out of student clubs. And, you know, that's a, it's an ideal seed moment to say, let's, you do your, your own club, but let's expand this out to something larger for the institution as a whole. First of all, Rick, thank you for the great out of the door direct question. And Maya and Emery, you just gave us a small book of, uh, of approaches and strategies. Rick, if you want to follow with more, um, but I think you've gotten a, a really good start there at Tabor now, thanks to those responses. Uh, friends, this is a, these are examples of, uh, of a Q and A. You know, just a straight question that you can just type in. Now let me give you an example of a video question. Uh, I'm going to bring up one questioner up on stage. Uh, our good friend uh, Tom Hames coming to us from Texas. Hello, Tom. Who is, who is that? Hi, Maya and Emery. I have no, I have no uh, idea who that we is. We don't know each other at all. <laughs> <laughs> You can't Hi, escape Tom. me. Hi, Hi guys. So um, I wanted to ask about accessibility. And uh, one, one of the issues that I have personally is uh, my wife recently got an Oculus. And uh, it gave me a splitting headache and made me want to hurl. Uh, because I, uh, I have vision issues. I'm, I'm, I have amblyopia. I have a very weak eye and a, and a strong Ooh. eye. Um, our, our mutual friend, uh, Jared Bendis is constantly trying out 3d things on me to see if he can get them to work. I mean, I'm, I'm like his torture case. Right. But, um, I'm wondering though, I mean, I know that the, that there, that is a fairly common issue with people who have certain kinds of vision problems, especially, but there's also a reactivity and mental equilibrium issue with some folks. I've heard numbers as high as 30% suffer from some sort of negative side effects from using VR. And I'm talking about XR, but I'm talking about X, XR, uh, AR has its own sets of issues. You, for instance, in my case, you can't put the display on this side because I wouldn't be able to see it. It has to be on this side, right? And those sorts of things come up too. But I mean, we have accessibility issues across the board in higher education. E equity is an, an issue overall. And when we go online and we're having to deal with Zoom and and thing and Shindig and things like that, they also bring with them whole new hosts of issues. I wanted to see if you guys had any thoughts and run across this in terms of dealing with it in the, particularly the VR space. Uh, I think that's more it's more of an issue there, uh, but also in the AR space if that's ever come up. Good right. question. Well, I th I think that the. You know, it, there is motion sickness. That, that's clear. I, I don't know how high it is. I've, I've seen that 30% thing too, and I've also seen less. I've seen whatever. Um, I think there's ways to minimize it. I think as the headsets will get better, it will definitely be minimized because part of the problem, uh, the big part of the problem is the latency between what you see and what your brain thinks you, where your brain thinks you are. And I don't know if we ever overcome it completely. Right. And we may always have accessibility issues in that regard to some degree. Uh, as you said, Tom, we have them in other areas of higher education. We seem to be having to constantly address them as we go along. Uh, there have been some other interesting developments. There's, um, you know, some, some big people with disabilities have developed apps to actually make VR more accessible for people that are in a wheelchair or at different height levels, or even if they can't 
use their their hands. So there's been some really good work being done here, though. I will say mm-hmm. the, ven- the vendors have not been doing this. These are people that have been doing it right. to some degree. Microsoft has been very good about accessibility, and that, that's because of a personal um, situation with the, their CEO. But, you know, outside of that, the, the other vendors talk a good game, but they don't do it. But within the community, things are happening. And, for example, platforms such as Walk in VR are, I think, groundbreaking for the way that they will add a, you know, they will make VR accessible. But would ever be completely accessible? Right. That, that, I, that I don't know. And I, I'm not sure that that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Now, it, yeah, and, and that, that's great. I mean, I, I agree that with certain kinds of disabilities, it, it can be game changing and life changing. I mean, if you have a mobility yeah, yeah. disability, then obviously, then that, that, that changes the ball game for you. But it, then it opens up other, I mean, with every, with every benefit becomes another set of issues. Like, again, the, 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 you know, you, you develop a new set of people who have sets of issues, right? Yeah. Um, the, the blind didn't mind too much with radio. It was more of a problem when we went to television, right? And yeah. so, right? So, but, but um, I do remember but, um, Maya and I, you, Maya, we were both there in our early days and we did a, we, we did a demo at a private school out in New Jersey and there was a student that was completely immobile and we were, she's in a wheelchair mm-hmm. and we were unclear that she could even do it. And, you know, the, her attendant came up and asked us if she could try it. We're like, sure. But we were just like so scared of what, what was going to yeah. happen. And. I, it was so beautiful. It was such a beautiful moment because she had an experience like I think she had never had before. And a, a bunch of us were in tears. I mean, not just us, but a bunch of people in the room mm-hmm. were like literally in tears, just watching her with joy go through an experience. We were just like, okay, there's that downside of accessibility challenges. It's also opening up a new world for people in ways that it, it doesn't yeah and you right. see the same thing with, with vr being used in in you know homes for the elderly um where people are bedridden now can't get out of bed but mm-hmm. you know people are providing them with experiences so they can go back and and see their hometown again or you know or even their house and that's as simple as doing three shooting some 360 video and popping it into a headset you know so right. for for yeah. all the challenges there's tremendous tremendous positive side here Sure. I think one of the best things I ever saw in some of that as well. And I I think that, you know, Tom, we don't have um, we actually don't have an answer to many very specific disabilities. Um, There isn't an answer. It's too early. Mm -hmm. It's way too early. Uh, The most important part is that we have this conversation. Um, and that, yeah. like, I hope that, um, you know, the educators here are going to have this conversation at their tables, at their institutions, um, and there are communities now that are addressing it. But no, the, I think uh, also like focusing on one specific answer to one specific disability is always, um, it's important, uh, we need to flag those, but we also have to under- have to really understand how early we are in this space. Yeah, we're so early. And in how important yeah. it is to be working in this space and advocating uh, for accessibility and as access uh, i have to say somebody here john mentioned something i'm getting my sea legs now i have <laughs> seen that phenomena many times where students will simply say i am very i get very seasick I'm, I'm i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna do it uh, five students try it and they're like i'm gonna try it i'm gonna try it and I'm like, okay, take us like we do all the the things, hand holding, chair, you know, <laughs> trying to to make them comfortable. That is important for me. That is important that students have a good experience. And it's um, you know, a lot of people don't invest in that. And I actually invest in my lab in how you onboard somebody, uh, which is critical. Mm-hmm. And then um, it is mm-hmm. just comes a week and a week after, and this person, that person that said. Oh, I'm gonna get seasick. They're back and they're learning the tool because they want to make a project in that. So we have a reaction. Our students, our faculty, our staff has a reaction to new things, to change, um, and that is mm-hmm. not accessibility. But there's oftentimes this phenomena, which is, um, you know, it it kind of takes a moment to to feel it, to try it, to navigate it. Um, start small, and uh, you know, ex- first experiences for people should be five to seven minutes. 
Uh, and yes, you actually build a muscle. And then we can, we start kind of tapping them on the shoulder. And I try to make sure my, my actually team uh, every two hours is out of VR and, and doing something else. So I think the accessibility is a very, very important. But as we start, we also need to create um, enough. Uh, in, in, we have to test it. We have to test it in different environments with different people, sure. understand. And that's ultimately how the solutions will come. Yeah. Uh, you know, just you know what just as sure. how they have come yeah. with other tools yeah mm -hmm. no i absolutely agree i mean you you have to experiment i just want to make sure that you know to me it's it's uh i've seen all too many tools developed where people are like oh everybody just pick this up and use it and and yeah. without recognizing <laughs> the unexpected barriers to entry yeah. like the one i suffer from i don't I don't consider what I have a disability. It's never real. It yeah, is specific. occasionally been a problem, but it's not a life changing thing. You know, there are plenty of one eyed people in the world, but it, it really hit me in the face, literally, with when, when yeah, I started with, trying to use and VR, it. It wasn't just the Oculus. I've used other systems and I have the same yeah. effect. The only one that doesn't mess me up is 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 uh, Microsoft's, which is, oh. is an AR system. Right. So yeah, yeah. Mixed, uh, mixed reality. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Um, right. But I was I, I want to say one more one more quick thing before I run out. But one of the most amazing things I have experienced in an, in a virtual environment in Second Life actually was someone built a uh, an environment where it showed you what it was like to be schizophrenic. Yeah, and so we can provide new insight into what it's like to live with much more serious disabilities than the one I suffer from uh as a teaching tool as well so i don't want to overlook that possibility as well or that 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 reality so and i'll sign off and let somebody else uh, yeah jump it's on actually stage. been used quite successfully uh for loved yeah. ones and caregivers in understanding people's experiences whether it's, oh. a, it's a different um you know the, on the autism spectrum or others because you know like being able to step into right. their shoes is a great experience about a birthday party where yeah. you know for us uh, a birthday party comes with loud cheer laughter uh it is you know all that is part of experiencing birthdays and for somebody on the spectrum that is that is exactly the opposite way for them That's to actually be engaged yeah. Uh, yeah. but that gives an opportunity yeah. for loved ones and caregivers um, to understand, and um, you know, I have students who are designing spaces, designing, uh, you know, things, and and that's such a, it, it, you know, it's such an asset to them to be understanding. Well, how do we design better hospitals? How do we design better spaces for these communities to feel better? So yes, um, that's why I feel like you know sometimes uh, we are going to wrestle with this. It is important that each and everyone is an advocate for our students uh, with different. Um, you know, with, with different abilities and create a space and an opportunity to enter. And at the same time, um, you know, it's it's the it's the questions that bring solutions. Well, thank Just you. Just let me know when you find a headset that won't make me sick and I'll be all over it, okay? Okay. <laughs> oh, and, and, See you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thank By the way, Tom is a, is a brilliant photographer, and I, I threw a link to his photos in the chat. Um, so he's... Uh, um, don't let him fool you. He's got an amazing, amazing vision. Uh, and that's also an example of a video question uh, here in Chindig. Uh, we have another one coming up right now. And by the way, Emery, Maya, thank you for all that information on uh, disability and accessibility. Uh, we have the uh, founding CEO of Course Tune, the uh, splendid futurist and good friend of the program, Maria Anderson. So let me bring her up on stage. Hello, Maria. Hey, I just wanted to add something here to the some some thoughts to the accessibility discussion. We were having this discussion at one of the places I worked at about six years ago around VR and how we could use it in, in classes and how we can make it accessible. And um, in a similar time period, I was I was looking at some some games that somebody was building, and and they were kind of like you had to explore the game to like learn the things. And one of the things I realized as I was exploring as I was playing the game was that I actually kind of hated playing the game. Like I, I was tired of having to like try jumping on things and moving on things. Like I just wanted to get to the learning parts. And for some people, that's what they want, right? Like there is not, it is not fun to try to navigate around in these worlds if you don't have good acuity at it, right? Even if you have no disabilities and that's just a personality type. And so one of the things that uh, we realized we could do in the VR spaces was to create a guided path where yeah. if you didn't want to do all the exploring on your own, it's like the difference between exploring a museum by yourself and exploring a museum with a guide, 
right? Okay. So like VR platforms could simply make a guided path with stops along the way that get you to all the places where all you have to do is press a button mm -hmm. to go to the next one, where there could be text to listen to, there there could be descriptions, like, and by allowing that guided path, you're not just serving the folks who might not be able to visually move on that path, um, but you also would be serving the folks who just simply don't want to waste time navigating around a system they're not good at navigating in. It's a great idea. Yeah, it is, so, definitely. Yeah. Are we already seeing this in the in, in XR spaces, my memory? I have no idea. That's just how we decided like we would solve it if we were to go down that path. Um, yeah, I think that different people are actually, I mean, that's what I'm saying. We have to try it because then it gives creativity to both, learn, you know, educators and also particularly people that are working in that, you know, enabling um, like able gamers and others. Uh, communities that have some solution and testing them in or having a solution where students can be paired um, and, and work, uh, you know, it's the collaboration that makes the experience happen. So I think yeah. certainly this is one of the ways um, to, um, you know, to try things. Yes, ultimately, do we want to be able to address uh, more, uh, you know, access, more accessible issues so that everybody has truly the authentic experience we want to give them? Um, we truly do, but I, I like these creative approaches as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, that's a great idea. Maria, thank you very much. That's all I had to add. <laughs> thank you. Because we have, we have more questions coming in. And as you can tell, we have brilliant people and they're approaching this topic from a whole range of areas. Uh, and now we have one that's actually aimed specifically at you, Maya. Um, and uh, I think, uh, Emery, you might uh, want to add something to this based on your own experience. This is a faculty development question. It's from uh, Chris Sharp, University of Florida. Um, and he asks, what strategies are you planning to use to encourage faculty to engage with and enter the physical innovation center at the new school? So how do you get faculty into the door? Um, I think that, you know, in, in my best bet is, you know, basically just, um, you know, the footwork that I do outside of the Innovation Center um, and the engagement that happens in conversations in, um, you know, in, in a variety of different spaces and venues across, um, across I think, the university. Um, <clears throat> but um, I am, um, I've been identified as a traffic draw on the, the floor that I am in right now. Um, so I think that happens by really, uh, you know, allowing for more intimate conversation to happen uh, in other words sometimes it's good to have uh, events and in um, you know opportunities a seminar a workshop all these are good but uh, people are usually motivated on a personal level on understanding how this actually works in their field um, in within that context of their course and so being kind of able to um, be uh, prepared to engage in that level. And usually uh, people with multidisciplinary backgrounds, which is where I start to begin with, uh, are able to do that because you, you always bring something of yourself in, in yeah. this conversation and being prepared to also address this. Um, as I've many times said, this shouldn't be somebody's second, third job. Uh, at least for a single, if you're really serious on your campus, at least, you know, if you can make it a permanently at, at the beginning, just give them that space, give them a three months or six months to start creating these synergies, uh, to try different things, engage these conversations um, to happen. Um, and then I oftentimes, um, you know, and I think in this conversation and others in this forum have said, um, our students are a great opportunity, a great doorway to um, actually for faculty to to actually glean into how how this is relevant to them, um, and so I um, I actually do joint events. And it, you know, five years ago when I started doing joint events, meaning I'm inviting faculty and students to the same workshop, the same open hours, the same everything. It was kind of like a bit of a novel idea, you know. Oh, a, a faculty development happens um, in a format uh, where it's just faculty, uh, and then clubs and students and student success. So, you know, somebody else on campus. Right that um, and I think of myself as a space that brings everybody from every corner everybody 
Yeah. And and that's, uh, I think, one thing. But I do engage knowing who I'm going to meet. Is it somebody from sociology or somebody from the arts or somebody from journalism? I, I oftentimes engage in, in trying to bring a very relevant angle to the work they do. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. I really appreciate it. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, I do. yeah we can. Yeah, yeah, okay. Definitely appreciate it. That, and that asks because uh, we're exploring... <laughs> something like this innovation center. Uh, I'm with the UFIT at the University of Florida. Um, there was a made at UF kind of VR lab that was uh, in our science library. And they recently decided to close that VR lab and just you know make the VR sets they had, you know, check out if students wanted it. And now we're kind of in that postmortem. Why did that VR space not work out? And mm. if we do something like this, how do we prepare ourselves uh, what, what do we do differently to make sure that it gets used? Because it was definitely underutilized. So that's why I, was, I wanted to ask about yes. this. Um, <laughs> the most common question to me for every event I did during pandemic is, is the lab open? When is the lab going to open? I think cool. you have to, you have to, um, you know, we have to engage with this community on all levels. And different campuses um, are engaged in different ways. Some have social networks, some they don't, some have, you know, are active in one or the others, or, you know, where, where you know, some, some have posters, <laughs> you know, all of the above. Um, and also, we've also had events that sometimes it's not the right day and somehow um, it didn't happen, but it doesn't mean we always been wanting to open doors and, uh, uh, you know, always also bring, um, a co like a, a lab assistant in the form of students from different campuses. I always, um, in particularly in my campus, but oftentimes campuses is thinking, oh, this is the students from the gaming department, or this is the student from the you know design department. And I've tried to actually hire and for a diversity perspective, but also because then they speak to their schools to to bring people from yeah, architecture, yeah. from philosophy, from journalism, um, to be part of the center from the performing arts, uh, you know, and 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 be part of this environment and and they become the best you know messengers um but also um you know you know offer offer opportunities um to try and that means offer opportunities in different uh in in different sort of formats times and um all of the above and uh, i'll just um add to this you know public yes. demos can also be very effective uh if you get a high traffic place and you know get out there and do something publicly you're gonna snag some people that may not know about it or say let me try this and even just some short compelling experiences i, I know maya I remember you telling me the story when you guys got one of your first high-end vr cameras and you went out on the street on the fifth avenue just to try it out and you had had students congregating around faculty, people nice. in New York City gathering around. She was stopping traffic on Fifth Avenue. And, <laughs> you know, it was all just like, you know, of course, the students start dancing and acting out because they want to see, like, how they're going to appear in a 360, you know, high end 360 <laughs> video. And that was just right, totally impromptu. You just you guys just wanted to try it. But the end result was is that you just you just perk the interest. You just all of a sudden it's like people went, wow, we, we have this. There's this thing here. And, probably wasn't so bad for recruitment either because people walking down the street were going well that's what they do at the new school that's interesting yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. To play the new school would you well, say yeah. that having students being able to come to your lab was was key to the success of innovation there because some people are like do we want students or is it just faculty to give them a safe oh. space to try out vr or do we make this open to both types of groups I mean, I would say do both, but if you have faculty and you know who they are, you can probably pick it up in five minutes that they're shy about this, they're nervous about it, give them the privacy give them the opportunity to try it in private because you know everybody to some degree or another feels like a fool when they have a headset on if somebody's watching it because you know you you're, you're doing actions out of context and they don't make any sense you know it's not even pantomime and because of that some people get very nervous and go well i don't want somebody watching me and you know there are labs that have set up dividers um you know so that there are more private spaces or others where there's open or but you know you if you have faculty that really need the privacy for just, you know, their, you know, their social concerns, don't force them into a public space. No, absolutely not. And or, or doing it in front of others, even in front of students. 
So on the one hand, yes, there's... and I want to say something else. Uh, think about all these things, but also find find a reason to celebrate somebody else. This is not just about the VR lab. It is not just about the team behind the VR lab. Find a reason to celebrate a faculty or somebody in the community, um, you know, who's who's tried something, or even a student, um, you know, create a, a hackathon. Um, if if you you know, and then that will give you the opportunity to design. Invite the faculty as mentors. Like um, there are lots of different ways to um, to foster this engagement, and that's usually the precursor to most successful curricular integration. Um, I think people sometimes feel like we, we need a headset, we need one faculty star, we can go. Um, that can work with the right support, um, but oftentimes, as soon as you have that, it, celebrate that work and bring others. Um, you know, in a way, um, you know, we in the season in Bulgaria, we have an expression that a single bird doesn't bring spring you need many birds to come back uh and that's what you need you need to uh engage and and and, and bring others to this conversation so, thank you many birds many birds for florida chris thank you <laughs> thank you for the great question um, yeah. and friends I, I hate to rush but we're, we're coming close to the end of our hour and we have more questions that are just great and you can tell that maya and emory are great people for answering them so uh, here's one from uh, Professor uh, Aaron Dambasu at the University of Canterbury. Um, and this is a question that feels like a historical question, which is then going to play off against a future question coming up. Let me explain. Uh, how would you recommend some best practices that bring in life logging, mirror worlds, augmented reality, and virtual reality in the context of teaching the metaverse? And by historical, I mean a lot of these uh, are, are things that we've been talking about for the past uh, 20 years. Um, I'll put it back up on the screen again so you can see it. Um, how do you how do you bring these into the XR world? My answer in a single word is storytelling. <laughs> in more in more deeper yeah. way, immersive storytelling, and complete you know and basically in you know I think uh, draw the connections um, between again what has been the human experience with. Um, with technology and its impact on us. And I oftentimes start my um, my course uh, with the early experiences of, you know, of the uh, of the caves in Alaska when people are actually trying to tell a story with fingerprints um, and then moving on to Greek theater and the Renaissance and all these uh, different mediums that have been a point of immersion in early movies and to come to this point in time and not not to mention that the, you know the metaverse was coined by an author uh, you know Neil Stevenson in Snow Crash and it's it's important to engage this specifically in, in this time it's important to engage our students in, in reflecting on that journey, um, you know, of that on a journey with, with media, um, and and then kind of think about where our technology, our tools, our platforms are taking us. Um, and I think that oftentimes for me though, it's not the it's it is it is good to start with text, it is good to start with images, it's good to start with video, but uh, it's really, I would say it again, it's nothing like actually experiencing that, creating in that medium that actually gives you the opportunity to fully reflect of how powerful it is and how different it is from the mediums, mediums below, such as um, in oftentimes video um, mm -hmm. and, and images. Storytelling is key. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a great answer for a great question, by the way. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Love this. Love this question. I mean, we can have a, a forum just on that. <laughs> just yeah. on that question, right? <laughs> now, let me turn this around because we have two questions uh, about what comes next. Um, and uh, one comes from uh, Professor Michael Meeks at LSU. Uh, hello, Michael, who asks, uh, we're early in this space. What are your thoughts regarding the timeline moving forward? So, uh, I think, Emery, you were talking a little while ago about full body uh, representation being 10 years out, for example. 
we we are early in this space. I would definitely say that. And I don't even like using the term metaverse. I don't think we have a metaverse yet in terms of what everyone is ultimately thinking about. Um, I think we'll get there, but I would say five to 10 years. But right now, we're not there. Our headsets need to get better. They need to be more powerful. They need to be cheaper. We need AR glasses, which of course everyone's stalling on because they can't, they really, we just can't compress the technology down to the size that we want. That's wearable. That's comfortably wearable in a pair of eyeglasses. So all this is coming, but it's just really going to take time. But I, I, but I do think that once we get consumer grade AR glasses, that's going to be a game changer. It will be the same kind of game changer that the iPhone was. We had portable phones, smartphones, so-called before there was an iPhone. But when we, we first got the iPhone, it just changed everything. And, um, you know, that was it was everything from the interface, from typing on the glass. There, there, I remember the, the famous thing. There was a reporter after the introduction of the iPhone, a reporter that said to Steve Jobs, I'll never be able to type on glass like I can with my BlackBerry on keys. And Jobs turned and said to him, you'll get used. You'll get used to it. And of course, you know, we've all gotten used to it, have we not? You know, it just took time. Again, it was going back to what we talked about with Tom in some ways. It's adoption. It takes time to master these things. But, um, you know, the the industry is changing fast. Things are coming. But, you know, it, it's the old thing of if you think it's all going to change by next year, no, it won't. If you think it's going to change in five to 10 years, you're probably underestimating the degree of change that there will be. Mm hmm. Well, that's a good that's a good way of uh, bracketing and framing this out in, in the chat. Uh, Melanie Hogue from uh, Southwestern says that. Uh, in her humble opinion, students' headphones, AirPods are normal attire and part of them, so it doesn't feel odd. So that's one one thing to uh, to imagine. Yeah, well, this- and, and AR glasses will be normal attire someday. They will be completely normal. And I, I don't know how I'm going to bike around New York City because as it is, I bike and people step in front of me because they're glued to their, their smartphone um, when they're wearing their glasses. And, and I don't know how people are going to teach because people are going to go, are they even looking at me or are they watching a movie or in some 3D virtual world while they're, they're supposedly looking at me? And that's, you know, we're going to enter a whole new realm once this comes out. But uh, we got a couple years to get there. Well, first of all, New Yorkers need no excuses to be obnoxious. But uh, sec- <laughs> second, oh, we're the sweetest people in the world. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but then, but then, this actually leads directly to the next question um, from uh, Professor Meeks, who asks you a specific timeline: um, How will the world of higher education look in five years? What percentage of online? What percentage of education will occur online in whatever format? So we're looking at twenty twenty seven. I think that while institutions are all on different timelines, right? And it's, it's um, just as people entering the whole XR space now and um, labs like mine are five years old, and I'm sure there are labs around here that have been two or three years or four years in, in the making, started in the making center, the library, um, other spaces. So I think, you know, it's, it's fair to acknowledge that for some time, probably for another decade, there will be different entry points of these experiences. Um, I do think that, however, more and more will transition online and in 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 some cases in virtual worlds. Um, uh, and I think that we may be living in a much more, um, you know, balanced digital and physical. And you have to really give students a reason to come to campus. Um, I think that you know, I think that we we will go back to campus. Uh, more fully, I think a lot of us, you know, want to be there. A lot of us are realizing and finding new ways that um, from this experience, learning and understanding that part of the course can be delivered through a not, to different, you know, different mediums and perhaps only part of the course should be happening in a physical space and what this, how this will happen. So I do, I do think that the format will continue, this, this, experience that we've won collectively over the last two years will um, in, in actually introduce uh, more broad, different formats uh, between asynchronous, synchronous, the online and the physical space. So I, I, I expect 
I think that some institutions will embrace it. Some institutions will embrace it in probably different ways. Uh, some will try to make certain experiences premium. Um, I think we're, we're likely to see all of that and say this is this is a better version of the online, you know, education. Or this is we'll meet uh, in mm -hmm. virtual spaces, and you know, we have traditions of of experimenting with that. That is all good. I, and I think that uh, in five years' time. Um, uh, I think that is, um, I don't know that necessarily there will be called VR labs, but there will be VR labs and there will be other centers of just, um, you know, basically um, that will enable both, um, yeah. you know, physical, um, you know, on location activities as well as immersive learning and, and more students will be interested um, who are in both traditional and online, what traditional, like what we understand that in the context of our collective experience in higher education, but in, you know, in a more, in on-site programs are likely to um, also not be um, a full semester on-site. I, I truly yeah. believe that, um, you know, it's likely that that is going to happen. Yeah. So um, more formats, definitely more online. Our institutions will uh, take their own time and space, uh, but I vote. I, I think that we'll see um, virtual world simulations, virtual experiences. Um, you know, kind of competing with with um, with com what we do today on in conferencing tools in, in the class. Yeah, yeah, in and the, in, the in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, because we're already seeing students go. Well, I don't. I can't come to class today, but this will be available online, right? Because if you're going to lecture, well, why not put it online? If I'm just, you know, if all it is is a lecture, then why am I, you know, if I don't come, I should still have access to it. And I think that's going to be one of the results of the pandemic. Yeah, and we'll have new careers that will embrace these digital experiences in much different ways. So in order for us to have our students actually ready, we'll embrace them. As And I yeah. think that um, there's just, I think there uh, there's lots of innovation that I expect to happen in this next five years, and it will be uneven, likely. Michael, you hit uh, you hit a fantastic question for us to end on, and Emery and Maya, my gosh, what a great great high note uh, to to close on. I, I'm afraid we have to end because we're at the top of the hour once more, and. Uh, we, we need to close up shop for the day. But l l let me ask, I, I believe the best way to follow Digital Bodies is on the website and also to follow definitely. each of you on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Yep. Right? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yep. Well, well, thank you very much. I, I expect we'll see some of those careers coming out of Digital Bodies uh, very, very soon. Thank you both for, for being fantastic, fantastic guests. Thank you for taking us much further. And thank you, everybody, for the, for the great questions. Um, thank you, Brian. Yeah, and uh, thank you for hosting us. Yeah, my pleasure. And Emery, please take care. Feel better. I will try. Definitely try. <laughs> but uh, don't go away yet, friends. Uh, let me just point out where we're coming to uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, so first of all, if you're really interested in this, uh, we have um, a, a whole series of questions and the slide didn't appear. Um, uh, so let me just point out, we have topics coming up uh, of all kinds. Uh, we have a whole series of sessions coming up on everything from Web3 to the climate crisis and how to pay for higher education. If you'd like to look back at uh, previous sessions, our forum archive is absolutely huge. And tonight we should have our 300th uh, recording there. If you'd like to keep talking about this on Twitter, just go to the hashtag FTTE and tweet at me or at Shindig or at Maya or Emery. Uh, and in the meantime, that's it for today. Thank you for fantastic questions and suggestions. I love the way that all together we think, dream, and plan together about this future, this one aspect of the future for higher education. In the meantime, everybody, enjoy spring as you get it. Please be safe and take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>